Hi, everyone, and welcome to our final OER um, session for spring of 2021. Um, today we have Amy Sage Webb Baza and Bethany O'Dowd, and they're going to talk with us about um, OER in action. And so I am happy to turn this over to you. Thank you for organizing this, Joelle, and thank you, Bethany, for everything that you're doing to make this available. Um, it's been great to hear what people have, have shared here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about creative writing specifically and, and then sort of transition to Bethany talking about some of uh, the tools that we've used. Bethany has been my, my go-to in this, as, as she is in so many things. Um, I just want to start off by talking about what it is to teach um, creative writing and, and why that's such a particular challenge, uh, which is not unique to creative writing, but is something to think about when you're wondering about getting involved in an OER. And one of those things is assessment. Um, that for our intro creative writing class, we have about five different things that we need to, to do for that class. And one of them is the Kansas Core Outcomes Group, that all of the, the universities that are part of that under the Board of Regents in the state get together around various courses and they come up with shared outcomes that those courses need to achieve so that students can seamlessly transfer from one to the other. Um, so our course has core outcomes in the state. Uh, we have creative thinking requirements for uh, assessment for uh, general education. We also have Gen Ed itself, which has a couple assessment pieces. Um, our course is part of the BA in English and the BSE in English. Um, and then it's also for creative writing itself, um, that class is not so much a gatekeeper class where you have to achieve a certain outcome. It's a feeder class. And so we want to see students um, demonstrating interest and achieving some levels of engagement more than like set uh, proficiency standards. Um, I'll just show you really quickly in a screen share um, what it looks like to see all of those together, which I mean, it's a little overwhelming. Um, here is a list of the assessments for this class. So here's Kansas Core Outcomes Group. I've color-coded them here. Um, if you're trying to do creative thinking, um, reacting, working in an imaginative way, characterized by a high degree of innovation, divergent thinking, and risk-taking, and there's a whole rubric that goes with all of those things. Um, and then Gen Ed, I mean, you can find Gen Ed at the um, Gen Ed's homepage. But here are some of general education's goals. And the ones that are highlighted are the ones that we would probably require students in that class to achieve, right? Um, and as I scroll down here, sorry for the scroll, the BA and BSE in English have several outcomes that we're trying to achieve. You put them all together and you have a list that looks a little bit like this, these 12 outcomes that we're trying to achieve in that one class, right? Um, so how would I do those things? How would I plan a class uh, that could meet all of those demands? Well, there aren't any textbooks that I've ever seen that are not so much content-based, but directed toward what you want to do in a program and what you might need to do in terms of assessments. So that's one of the first really big arguments for why you would use an OER, is that you can start thinking about how does this thing that I'm doing for the content fit into this particular component um, of my planning, right? Um, we also, in that class, we teach four genres, poetry, fiction, creative nonfiction, and playwriting. That in itself is a little unusual. Most of, of creative writing textbooks are arranged around genre, but they tend to be single or dual genre. It's rare to find three genres and very rare to find four. And if you do find four, they're probably not taught in equal depth or in some of the same ways. Um, creative nonfiction is unique among those three in being presented differently than the other two. Um, so just finding those four genres is a challenge in any textbook. Um, and then the approach of that class is it's a constructivist class. We're going to be breaking down the genres into elements of craft. That's pretty typical across any program. 
that you'll see that the courses are taught, um, poetry might be taught in terms of imagery, lines, stanza, those kind of major muscle groups, right? But how granular that breakdown is varies widely from one textbook to another, from one genre to another, right? Um, which elements they teach with which genres, that varies pretty widely. Okay, so there's a lot of customization that already has to go with creative writing. And then there is also that our methodology for that class is writing process. Um, we, we base this on the writing process movement of composition. The goal is to give students a lot of low stakes writing activities that add up to a product so that we're not assessing product in a val qualitative value, but we're engaging students in a consistent writing process. And that fits with the goal of that course as a feeder into the next class, et cetera. And not all textbooks are structured that way. A lot of them that do cover these elements of craft will say, go write a story. And, we're, and we have to say, no, 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 no. We're not going to have you writing a story every single time. We're going to have you doing smaller stakes writing activities. There are textbooks like that out there, generative writing textbooks in poetry and in fiction. It's much more rare to find anything like that in the other two genres. So that's kind of the challenge of this one kind of wonky class, which I'm choosing for the, for the purpose that it, it represents sort of the, the perfect storm of challenges that you might face in a class. Um, so in the way that we would break down, uh, I'll just screen share this with you really quickly so you can see how we might break this down. Um, we might go through poetry and break it down into these elements. Prose might be broken, and prose could mean creative nonfiction or fiction, uh, and it might be broken down into all of these things. And you notice how granular you can get if you're talking about dialogue. And one of the conversations we have to have in our program is, well, how granular are we going to get at the intro level? Which of these are we going to pick up in the 300 level course? How do, the, how do the classes scaffold on each other? And what layers of richness are we expecting to add as students' writing goes on? Um, so these are very cool conversations that we get to have in our planning and pedagogy. Um, narration itself has a lot that goes into it. Um, so this is just, and no, no textbook out there is probably going to cover all of these to the degree that we might like. And so there's been a lot of customization, looking up material, et cetera. And the way we've kind of broken it down in this class is like this, that we've decided these are the three things we'll teach when we teach playwriting. These are the eight things we'll probably teach in fiction. And then these are probably the things that we'll teach in creative nonfiction. And then poetry, we're going to teach these things up here, right? Um, so that is a challenge. Now our methodology for how we do that, almost consistently, what we're doing is not all that unfamiliar in the discipline, is that we introduce the concept, and that means defining it, giving the vocabulary, the history of a literary tradition, a genre, etc. So there's a lot of research that goes into that, uh, which we've had to do, and some books do well in some areas and not others. Then we need examples. And all textbooks have a reader, right? But the reader is typically not aligned with the elements of craft. I just don't see that done out there. It's not happening. So you typically see on creative writing groups and, and listservs, somebody's always asking for the, the perfect example of something. So somebody just today was saying, I need an example of a creative nonfiction essay in which um, setting is personified. I want to see personification of setting in creative nonfiction, um, to which you say, well, good luck, you know. So we're all kind of looking for the perfect example. And over the years, I've been doing this for 25 years, you start to identify what are exemplar ways that I can use one story to teach all these different elements of craft. Now, when you get these books and their anthologies, which are sometimes sold separately as a an additional cost to, to students, those tend to be not as contemporary, not as diverse, not as experimental or interesting as we might like. Um, so a lot of the material that we rely upon, um, we obtain copyright from other writers we know, uh, material in the public domain, etc. So building the reader is another piece of this. 
Uh, we're always going to ask students to analyze those examples as writers. And this is another challenge. There's not a lot of material out there for how to read as a writer. There are a lot of reading questions for analyzing literature, but not so many around these elements of craft. So we have to write those. That's a challenge. Um, and then we need to write generative activities or writing prompts that would engage students in practicing these major muscle groups. What is an activity that would help a student embody dialogue in a scene? What would that look like? So we have to write a lot of those. Some textbooks have really good ones, some not so, so rich in some areas. And then there has to be a kind of sharing and discussion component. And then, of course, the assessment. How are we going to quantitatively or qualitatively assess that? So that's kind of what we're up against in those classes. Um, and there are lots of textbooks out there, but and I, I could provide a list for, of them if you're really interested in learning about creative writing. Um, but for our purposes, I mean, the most important thing is that OER has been a way to explore how could you begin to address the challenge that we have here. Um, now, Bethany knows this program really well, and I've talked to her a lot about it. And she was working with library guides, which she puts together for um, various disciplines. She's done amazing library guides for the art department, for lots of other areas of campus. Um, and we wanted to kind of see what library guides could do. And so creative writing and its weird set of problems became kind of a way to see what that mechanism could hold. And we did a lot of different library guides to experiment with that. And um, I created these as kind of flipped classroom activities where students would um, do some of this work. Instead of me going out and finding all the examples, they would be finding the examples. They would be sharing their own writing uh, and seeing how that would, how that would look. Um, so I'll show you one, which is um, for that creative, that intro class. We did a library guide. I'll screen share with you. Uh, here we go. This is intro creative writing. And you can see each of these poetic forms has its own tab. Um, now, one of the things that we gave students leeway to do was to arrange. Bethany created a, a module in Canvas that trains students how to do this. And she was their tech and troubleshooter as they learned all the, the website building challenges. Um, now, some of these are arranged probably better than others. That's one of the things we learned is that maybe letting students arrange it in their own way isn't always the best idea. Um, so we may not like the way this is arranged as much as we like this one. Um, this one's pretty good. Um, the students all had to go find this information. They had to find it in the public domain. They had to make it identifiable so that somebody reading through it could learn how the form works, not just learn about it, but how it works. Um, and then they could share examples of their own writing. So this is one of our ESU students uh, writing. And you see they've got this color coding in here that gives you examples of different words. Um, and this is a fantastic tool. I'll show you one other one, the guzzle. Um, this student chose to use this sort of tabbed box material that you're seeing. So you've got this example by Aga Shahid, then you've got David Welch. And notice there's been some color coding in here, um, color coding through here. What this allows you to do is that the next students in the next class can come in and they can assess what the previous students have done. They can assess hey, did you cite your sources? Do the links go where you said they would? Um, do they read well on all of our devices? Um, is color coding going to work for somebody who's non-visual, right? Are some of these tools going to be accessible? Is there alt text for the images? Are the images meaningful? So those are the kinds of things that you can start to do. Um, now, in this mechanism, we've also done a number of other classes. Here's another one, Eco-Criticism. This is a literature class um, where we've got an overview. We've got resources that are in our library. So this one actually directs you to resources. And then there's other resources, right? 
videos. This is the kind of stuff that you can't do in a textbook is, is videos and TED Talks, right? Um, you can assign students to different concepts. You can assign students to define different elements of eco-criticism, for example. So this one is post-humanism. Um, they have to find an image that's meaningful that is in um, Pixabay or public domain, and they have to alt text it and all of this. So it's a very meaningful, deep experience for them uh, to go through this process. This is another literature class where students, this textbook doesn't exist, where you could find a collection of American women writers who are writing in one of these four genres. That reader's just not out there. And if it is, it's probably not looking at the, the work in quite the way that we're looking at it. So they had to kind of define their genres, um, embed you into the history and some of the major figures. So they had some common denominators that, that I asked them to do for these activities, um, defining, finding examples, etc. cetera. Um, contemporary examples are then placed alongside the more uh, classic, right? And then they did their own book profiles as well. So here you see student reviews of these contemporary books. So we now have this resource that didn't exist before. Um, and this one, I'll show you one more, um, is entirely student writing. There is no textbook for, I mean, there are textbooks for world building. In fact, one of them is an electronic resource in our library, and that's great. But it tells you how to do it. It doesn't really give you examples or ways to share them. And so in this class, I was able to create, um, I actually had a graduate student that I, I did this class with, Kent Garrett, and I thank the graduate uh, office for that graduate assistantship. And we created all the modules in Canvas that would teach students how to do these elements of world building, like creating a language system, creating all these elements of your world. Um, so let's look at this one. Um, a student who's writing a longer project can profile their own project here. This is a timeline that was one of the factors that you had to create. Um, you had to draw a map, and she actually did the art herself. Um, so this is a map from her world. You had to explain how the natural world worked, and she has all these drawings here. I could never create a book like this. These are just amazing. The naming conventions of your world and how they work, the mythology of your world and where these, these come from. And then she can start actually putting her chapters up on this world guide for discussion. Um, so that's a pretty intense activity that students are involved in. Um, I'll, I'll show you one more, and, and this isn't really an OER, but it is, a, and Bethany's going to talk about all this, so I'm not going to take her piece of it. Um, having worked on these with Bethany uh, and seeing what they could do, uh, I had a grant with an undergraduate student, an ESERP grant this past summer, and she, we wanted to roll out press books and see how it would work for the challenge that I just described for, for intro. And what she was doing, her learning objectives were writing skills for the state of Kansas for public schools and also socio and emotional well-being for those standards. And she wanted to create a creative writing resource guide for um, youth who are incarcerated or otherwise in the system there's a long tradition of programs that serve young people using writing to work through some of these activities, uh, these problems that they're, they're facing. And she wanted to see if there was a way to also align that with some learning objectives so that they could get credit for this, so that teachers in school could better work with them. Um, and so this is what we did this past summer. I'll just show you um, if I can screen share it. There we go. What Hannah did, um, we're just into the dashboard here. She wrote an intro and a, a user guide for teachers who might want to use this material. And then she broke this down. This will look really familiar to you, having seen you know, what we're up against in creative writing. She describes what observation is as a particular skill. She sets some learning objectives. 
here's what it will do for you, uh, right? Here are the social awareness skills, right? Um, she breaks down the vocabulary and she aligns it, right? She has activities for students to engage with, and, and there are activities for different levels and different amounts of time and different contexts. Um, there's not an assessment with this because that's not this type of um, environment, but there are some follow-up activities and then some, some prompts, right? See what she's done here. It's really pretty amazing. I mean, she's kind of got some ways that you can you could assess it, but it's not really based on, there, there's no rubric, you would say, for a grade. A teacher could come up with that if they wanted to, though. Um, so what she did here is pretty amazing. Um, and it, it is exactly what we're trying to do in that intro class, as you can see. She also, in the back, has this bibliography of all these sources, which is incredibly useful of how she's drawing from those. And then this resource guide. If you knew nothing about these sorts of programs, here's information about them, right? So that was a textbook, that, a small textbook that has six very dense units in it that was created in one summer that is now available for teachers in public schools, for people who are working in prisons and incarceration and other programs uh, that didn't exist before. And making it free and accessible is essential to that population. Um, so those are a couple examples and how library guides kind of helped us get there. Um, and then Bethany, I'm going to let take the rest of this. <laughs> All right. So Amy talked about the different outcomes that her course has to follow through. And so I wanted to also demonstrate some outcomes that the library focuses on when we have one shot sessions or when we work with departments in their classroom. So we have the ACRL framework, which is a framework on information literacy, and that's the Association of College and Research Libraries. And it's a subgroup of the American Library Association. And so we have these six frameworks that we try to align our lesson plans with when we work with different departments. But for this specific project, um, we were able to focus on information creation creation as a process, which is information is presented in a variety of formats. So students are locating not just book sources, but they're looking at videos and websites, online sources, ebooks, um, just a variety of different types of sources. There's information has value. So students are learning how to provide um, credit, pro, you know, proper attribution and citations for any sources that do not belong to them. Um, and then also scholarship is conversation where students are engaging in that conversation in the research and presenting their own ideas, their own content to that project. So library guides. Um, Library guides are known as LibGuides. It's kind of uh, switched back and forth, but they're also uh, research guides. They can be seen as mini websites. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that we refer to library guides that they basically cover a wide range of research topics, subject areas, and they might even be course specific research guides where we work with specific faculty, specific departments, and develop a guide to focus on a specific, even assignment. Um, I have a couple in the communication department where they actually have assignments in those classes where we create an entire guide so that students know what sources are available to them, how to do research in that specific subject area. Um, you know, it just covers a wide range of things that we might not be able to cover in one one-shot session. You know, that might be an hour session and you can't fit everything in there. So they are usually created and managed by the librarians with the purpose of sharing information, linking to resources from the library and research help about a specific topic. So my colleagues, you know, there's five, six librarians here and we all manage our own collection. I have maybe 40 50 guides that I'm responsible for revising and updating and whatnot throughout the years. And that kind of totals out to be hundreds of guides available just at Emporia State University. So if you're curious to see what guides are available, just go to the library's website at emporia.edu slash library. There is that research guides icon that's right there on the front page, and that will take you to the entire um, listing of all of them. If there is a guide that you don't see, because I mean, we have guides on APA citation style, MLA citation, um, 
how to create a website, how to do uh, literature reviews. So there's just a lot of different types of um, guides out there. But if there's one that you're seeing that you that you need um, that you'd like to put in your own classroom, then contact your liaison liaison librarian and. There's a in the navigation menu of the library's website, there is a tab called instruction and if you click on that it will give you the list of all the librarians here at the library with our assigned areas and how to contact us. So our, lib our library guides considered OER, um, yes and no, mostly no, technically library guides are um, they're a free resource for their library patrons to access, and they typically uh, include resources specific to the library. So things that we pay a lot of money for that we want our patrons to access, or links to our book collection, you know, that maybe someone who's not a member of our institution or that doesn't have a Kansas resident card with our library that they can't access. So um, in some cases, guides might have password locks on them where you have to actually have your username and password in order to access. Um, but they are considered low or zero cost to students because library guides are hosted on a platform called SpringShare. And um, this basically is a subscription that the library pays a couple thousand dollars for. And a common question that we get from people is, you know, it, well, if I use flip guides, is it going to go away? Because, you know, we're in budget cuts and, you know, there's that always that concern. But SpringShare is probably one of the most valuable resources we have um, for service here at our library. So we host our um, chat widget that you see on the homepage. That's how we actually host that chat. And I know there's a lot of free chat widgets out there, but this specific chat widget actually um, provides stats so that we can keep track of questions, common questions, so that maybe we can promote workshops that help answer those questions. Or it tells us when questions are usually um, asked the most so that we can create staffing and decide how many people we need to have at the service desk. There's a lot of decisions that we make at that um, general service level that we use SpringShare for. Also, the uh, database A to Z list that almost everybody accesses just to get to our long list of 180 resources, that is hosted on SpringShare, SpringShare as well. So basically, if we lost access to SpringShare, we would be losing a really valuable resource. So in my honest opinion, I think that if we were to be losing SpringShare in this access, it would be because we were replacing it with something better. Um, so if that kind of helps ease that concern and you're like, but I'd really like to use them, I just don't know if they're available, I'm pretty confident we'll have it for a while. Now, looking at LibGuides as OER versus free, they are a free resource because they include content that is maybe videos from YouTube. Um, they might have library resources, so direct links to eBooks. The nice thing about LibGuides is that they can embed all the widgets with the advanced features so that the student, when they're putting in that content, they just have to have the links to things. They don't have to know all that fancy coding because it does it for them. There might be direct links to library databases. So, um, you know, if we want students to use JSTOR or Bloom's Literature or, um, you know, Oxford Dictionary, then we can embed those directly into that guide so anyone looking at that subject area doesn't get confused by the long list list of 180 resources because it's only looking at what is um, recommended. And then links to online resources, so anything on the web. So, you know, that's where we kind of get that, where is the LibGuide actually an OER? Because the content that you can put in there, you can put OER in there. You can embed those resources in it. So content included in each guide is unique to the topic, which means the content can be just about anything. Um, original content can be from librarians, faculty, or students. And in our case that we're presenting today, um, it's students. It's student work. Students are contributing either their own poems, their own um, in the world building fiction guide. There's, you know, Sarah, the guide that we just looked at, Sarah's guide is all her own original ideas. And even from the librarian level, original content, I'm writing a lot of that stuff. So that's my content that I'm sharing with everyone else. So that's where we can link to that OER access. And also I have this little icon here. So a lot of times when I'm doing research or if I'm new to a topic or if I'm presenting on a specific subject area, I'll go out to Google and I'll actually put in my search terms with library, library guide at the end of it because there are tons of universities and colleges that also have library guides with SpringShare. And in a lot of cases, they'll have this icon at the bottom where it will show that you can use that guide in your class. You know, it is also seen as an OER to some level. So 
in our uh, research, we did a lot of experimenting with different guides and different classes, and I wanted to kind of rank them here to show what level was the most OER versus what level was more free. Um, so Amy presented the World Building and Fantasy Fiction Guide, which is probably the most OER that it gets for the library guides, because uh, the guide that we looked at, which was from Sarah Richardson, uh, that's all of her own ideas. The drawings are all her own drawings. Everything about her guide is her own work that I don't think there's very many links, if at all, that link out to other sources. So that is probably the most OER we can get. Um, then you have the Creative Writing Poetry Guide, which is um, a lot of student work is included in there. Students are writing their own definitions, but they're also linking to other sources that are free on the internet. Um, they might be linking to resources that are free at the library. So there's kind of more of that even level there. Advanced fiction is also a guide that is very similar to the creative writing poetry guide where um, it is more students are writing reviews about books that they recommend, but the books that they're recommending are not OER. The books they're recommending are books from the library collection or books that they would recommend for purchase at Amazon. And then finally, the studies in literary genres comics is a class that Amy um, and I taught with Jonathan Leach, and it's a, basically the guide that we created for that. Students went out and found a um, graphic novel author or an artist, and they did some research on it, and they found either their own content or they linked to the library's resources. But for the most part, they're embedding library resources in there, so that is probably the most free example that we have for the library guides. And so I hope that kind of makes sense. I have a couple of examples to kind of show you um, what those guides look like. And if we have time, we can also kind of look at them. I'll screen share out to look at them. But we have the um, guide on haikus that Amy presented earlier, where students are sharing all of this information, but they're also linking to where those um, that information is found. And so information in here could be student examples, and it can also be links from library resources as well. This is another guide um, that also shows different layouts, but student examples and links from outside sources as well. And Amy did a really good job of talking about how we use copyright and citing sources and how they're included and embedded into these resources, but also the accessibility. So uh, the nice thing about library guides is the platform already has that accessibility built in so that when students are learning how to use this, they're understanding that having things in boxes helps screen readers read this content better because it tells them the order that the content should be read in because as you're kind of looking at this, it's sort of just scattered everywhere. So you have to be very intentional about how you map out your guides and students are encouraged before they even start putting content into the guides to actually um, map it out on a piece of paper and review how that content is going to be presented for all types of um, users. We also have the world building and fantasy fiction and this is a basically to kind of talk about how some guides are set to be public so that anybody outside the university could also access them. They might not be able to access all of the resources because some resources embedded might link to the library itself and they'd have to be a member to actually access that. Whereas um, some guides are actually set to private so that students didn't, you know, especially the world building guide is the best example. Students were told that the only people that could view their work is people that work here at Emporia State University. So that kind of helps um, protect their work, uh, helps them also be intentional about what work they want to share publicly and what to share privately. Uh, it kind of helps engaging students with that copyright and that flipped classroom approach as well. And then this is the advanced fiction um, guide to kind of also show that students might not be developing all of the content, but they're also um, linking to other sources out there that are not OER, but they are available at the library. And then finally, this is our comics guide. And I wanted to show the comics guide because this was a guide that I actually created that I had um, basically recruited the students to help me enhance because this was to 
promote the library's comic and graphic novel collection, which is probably about six years old now. And I needed help in getting that content updated and really helping find ways to market it to students so that they were excited about this kind of um, content. So this is an example of basically how even databases can be directly embedded into these resources, but with these kind of content, which is free, free for the users that are ESU members, um, they can see this. But if you were outside of university or you weren't logged in to the proxy that you see, which is the login, this content would be blank. So um, not everyone can access all of the different layers of a library guide. I had a question. So you mentioned not all the content is available. And, and um, so I was thinking earlier that the LibGuides is probably a good choice because um, as opposed to Canvas, because Canvas would be like a course specific kind of thing, or, you know, if you, if, if you no longer had a Canvas course. But um, what other reasons for how you decide to put it LibGuides or Canvas or, or whatever? It's just my question. That is a, that's a great question. Um, we have a, my, my colleague Kevin Ravis and I have a CRIG grant this year to tackle that big intro creative writing class challenge. And one of our options would be to create it as a Canvas course and publish it on Creative Commons. And that would work. And that makes that material accessible to other teachers predominantly, right? Um, if we put it on Pressbooks, that's another option that puts it out there publicly. So those are the two for teachers, right? Um, for other students who might be at ESU, they might not have access to that material in the same way if I put that material onto one of those platforms. And so some of the things that we were looking at um, had to do with this challenge of helping students throughout a curriculum to have access to the kind of material that they just couldn't find in any textbook, if that made sense, um, and to share their own work. So that was some of our decision making, but Bethany probably has um, better decisions for you about how, how to uh, one of the nice things is library guides can be directly embedded into Canvas. So as an external URL where it actually embeds it and students aren't navigating outside of Canvas because one of the best practices about online learning is keeping the student in that classroom. And if that classroom is Canvas, we want to keep them in Canvas as best as we can. So I really love that Canvas now is very um, it's adjusted so that when it does embed the resources, the library guides directly into Canvas, students are still in Canvas and they're navigating around those different tabs. So I would never really want to build them outside of the classroom. It, instead, it's a resource that helps enhance what's going on in the classroom. So a lot of um, guides, I'm hoping that you are curious and that you want to go and see if there's guides that you can add in your class. But we would be absolutely thrilled if the faculty on campus would embed a lot of our guides into the classroom so um, that students have all those resources on how to do research, how to cite sources, and even those subject specific, like how to do research for this specific assignment. Um, I think one of the other questions that Amy and I kind of debated when we first started thinking about this project was li library guides versus just building it on a website platform because websites are free like Google Sites, Wix, Weebly. Um, those are free platforms that students can actually create their own user accounts and have that content themselves. But we wanted to host it because that way the, the university had access to that that they could share with students and there wasn't that passing of passwords around and um, it, it made it more accessible but it also helped archive the original research that was done and um, also the different features that are embedded in that platform tool spring share that allows students to have that more flexibility uh, that they need for embedding resources because most students at this level don't have any kind of coding experience so it just helps ease that worry that they might have to have if they were to do it on Wix or Weebly. So Bethany, if I could follow up on that a bit, one of the um, discussions going on by this year's um, Craig Steering Committee is about things like infrastructure, like um, a press books um, subscription or something. Would that would that help people who are building out courses, or are library guides a good a good way to go? I mean, or or would press books offer some advantages for instructors? 
I personally really like the platform for Pressbooks. I know Jasmine Linneberry also used Pressbooks, and the formatting is just incredible. I mean, it kind of eases that accessibility that a lot of us um, are worried about, making sure that those platforms are accessible, that the PDF that students download is accessible. And so I think that the Spring Share is a little bit more advanced. You have to be very intentional about where you put things. It's not directly embedded as a feature for students, um, for any user really. So I don't, honestly, I don't know. Um, I have my own personal research. I think li library guides are the, a great alternative, like a perfect alternative, because there's so many things that you can embed into it. There's so many ways that you can present that information. But I mean, honestly, I don't know. That's a huge conversation that goes almost above me, too, at a department level is, does the library want to host all of these um, other resources? For me, the answer would be absolutely yes. Um, I have five other librarians, though, that might be like, well, <laughs> you know what I mean. When there's a collection at, at ESU, like our zine collection, uh, which was just started by Sarah and our comics collection that Bethany is managing, those library guides lead students into the resources that are here and they're incredibly helpful in that way um, but to me when you're looking outward at some challenges in the discipline that there just isn't a resource like what you need you probably need to be looking outward and, and looking at something like creative commons or press books because it, it doesn't cycle back into the university and has a, a wider conversation I think it could also be ownership too. Um, you know, I know that press books, I, I'm not that familiar with it, but it seems like the author has more ownership over that. Whereas the library guides are owned by the university library. Um, you know, we pay for that platform. So I, I guess there's also that conversation of copyright and what that looks like for everybody. It's about a hundred dollars for the license. I think that's what ours was. Well, we're, we were talking about an institutional um, commitment, so it would take a little more than that, but, <laughs> but it would allow us a lot more, you know, toys. That would be tremendous, really. Um, did you want to talk about that accessibility piece, Bethany, with um, McLeod? I think that's an important factor here about what's available out on the internet and whether we can use it. But basically in the comics class that we taught, uh, we used a book called The Understanding Comics, The Invisible Art by Scott McCloud, which um, it's important to mention that it was published in 1994. So that was uh, probably one of the most primary textbooks available for that topic. It was widely recommended to us. We saw a lot of courses that embedded that specific textbook. It's about $20 on Amazon. Um, so the library, you know, when you're looking at the what is free to the students, the library uh, has a copy. I actually think we might have two copies of that book and we put both of them on course reserves. So that students that maybe couldn't afford the textbook, they could go to the library, check it out. It was on course reserves for a one to two day checkout. So, you know, you kind of help limit how often students were so that more students could utilize it, but that limits it to only students that are on campus. So that definitely is um, an area that we hope that course reserves can improve in the future because we can't just scan that entire textbook and post it online. That would violate copyright. So speaking of just scanning the book, that doesn't mean that those types of resources aren't out there on the internet. And in this case, there was uh, multiple people that had scanned this entire textbook and put it somewhere on the internet. Internet Archives is a place that this happens a lot, where there is not permission to put this information on there, but somebody does, and you know, it might not have been found just yet or pulled from the author or publisher. In my, my opinion, that might be because it's an older book and maybe they just don't care anymore, but that happens a lot. And so the questions that we have to answer a lot as librarians is actually, you know, can I link to that? If it's free, can I link to it? And the answer is no, you, you cannot. You are encouraging people to take that content and just steal it. I mean, you're contributing to that um, copywriting and that plagiarism and whatever you want to call it. So uh, does that mean that you can't, you know, mention it and say, you know, that if you do a Google search, you might find it. I'm not going to stop students from finding information. I'm not going to stop students from going to Google 
but we have to keep that in mind as when we're create, you know collecting OER resources that just because it's on the internet does not mean that is openly freely available to use. Um, so we have to be very careful about that. And in this case, it was not. Um, what we did do for as far as an accessibility is we realized that this textbook was not accessible and because it was written in a graphic novel format you know we had to think about alt text and so the students were actually assigned um, a couple of pages where they wrote the alt text for the for a certain chapter and so that hopefully future students can actually use that as examples and that kind of falls under that fair use and academic use because I mean it's probably not even one percent of the book itself so you have to also think about that copyright and what can I scan what can I share with my students you know there's that rule of thumb I guess that you can share 10 percent of a resource but that's not really documented anywhere so it's just better to ask permission in my opinion than just sharing and copying and you know making pdfs of books and then sharing it um, but did that kind of make sense Amy yeah and we okay. did ask McLeod if we could um, mm -hmm. teach students about the difficulty of the text visual interplay of comics and accessibility because that's really a challenge um, using that book and, and he was very gracious about it uh, allowing the students to to use that textbook to start creating an OER with it um, so that was a, a very authentic deep learning experience for students um, that taught them all sorts of things that were not just about comics and started moving us toward the resource that doesn't exist, which is an accessible online version of McLeod. Um, so sometimes the, the lack of resources could actually lead to a really deep, authentic learning experience. Amy, could I ask you a question about, um, you know, the difference between textbook and um, an OER approach. So one of the things that excited me when I read the UNESCO report was not just, you know, that this presents an opportunity for cheaper resources, but that also it puts faculty much more in control of um, what they're teaching. Um, and, and I'm seeing that with some of the examples you guys put forward. So it, it looks to me like um, students are both creating, adapting, and adopting sources um, so that they're much more active than they would be for a textbook. Is that, is that a true assumption? Or can you talk about that a little bit? I think that's a good assumption with the examples that we're talking. It wouldn't have to be that way. I mean, the professor could just make all those decisions and not involve the students. Um, but the students are often much more engaged with a genre and um, much more able to lend that currency to it than I would be. You saw the depth and the range of what we're trying to cover. And so partnering with the students in creating up-to-date readers has been revelatory and, and really great for us. Um, the, the activities in which the students engage that we write are our piece of it, but the writing is the students. And so being able to share those examples with a wider audience is, is really great for them. In a textbook, you might see one or two student examples, um, but we've been able to work with the students in, in really helping to identify who's doing examples that could teach the next students down, down the way. And every time a student thinks about teaching the material to someone else, they really know it right? They really know how to read as a writer if they can explain it to somebody else. Uh, and so that has been the way it's been working for us. I don't know that it would always be that way, but it's been that way for us. I looked a couple of years ago, Amy and Bethany, for um, a, a really good cheap Shakespeare source. Um, and of course, there's a lot of Shakespeare out there that you could, you know, just have your students access. But it seems to me what we're paying for is the editorial scaffolding. So, you know, all of those years and years of just editorial insight, which um, makes uh, an, an older text like Shakespeare kind of inaccessible for modern students without. So I'm wondering um, if you guys have, 
I don't know if I have a question in here. It was more of a struggle, but um, what what are the what what are the give and takes here of um, you know a, a published piece of literature as opposed to you know an OER without that editorial scaffolding, or or are there other answers there? I, That's the struggle, Jerry. Right there is. I mean, I may love the way Janet Burroway unpacks narrative point of view, but I've written better stuff for describing dialogue. And so is it worth having students buy Janet Burroway's textbook knowing that my lectures are going to be the ones that teach those components? So um, the editorial scaffolding is it, and, and we have to create a lot of that, or we have to reach out to authors to reproduce stuff that we like and, and writers tend to be pretty giving in this way um, finding contemporary examples uh, there's lots of published work available online in the public domain uh, you want it dylan thomas uh, villanelle you can find one but a contemporary author writing a villanelle might be somebody that we would know and they're more likely to give us copyright to use that material in our classes if they know that the editorial scaffolding has come from something that they've seen us do in their own classes. And um, Kevin's playwriting, for example, we have some contemporary plays that we use from Lisa Greenwood, who's a playwright in Kansas City. Um, and Lisa's been here, she's worked with us. Um, and so we're able to offer her plays to our students, which are meaningful. And she knows how we're treating that material because she sees that partnership. But um, there are some things that you give up. I mean, um, I really like the way David Starkey uh, unpacks uh, a couple of genres, I think, better than I would do. And so it's, it's kind of a give and take. Kevin Rabus does this performance on blues poetry. And he's done, he used to work at the Jazz Archives in Kansas City. He's a jazz mu musician himself. He's a drummer. Um, and so he's able to teach something in a really unique and meaningful way that I would not find in any other resource out there. He's got all the lectures, he's got all the history to back it up. Um, and so there's a, there's a piece right there that's part of our curriculum that can go into a textbook that I wouldn't find. Um, and when you think about textbooks, they tend to be written in the most broad-based way possible to reach as many programs as possible. And so in terms of that customization, you're sometimes able to get a level of depth and expertise writing it yourself or relying on local experts because it doesn't have to be sold to all these programs and MFA. That's another thing in creative writing is most programs are related to MFA programs. And we don't have an MFA program here. We have very different program structure. So what's going to be meaningful to us is very different. All right, well then I will pass on my gratitude and my appreciation to both Amy and Bethany for providing us with all of this wonderful information. Um, I had a chance as you were presenting to look at some of the LibGuides and I, they, those are pretty, pretty impressive. Um, students have done really good work um, with the mythical world and contemporary women writers and that's very cool. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I will wrap us up and tell you all, thank you very much.